Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Lapp. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Education here at the Melman School of Public Health at Columbia University. And on behalf of our Dean, uh, Linda P. Freed, um, we are delighted um, to co-sponsor um, this magnificent event. Um, as I was just saying to Dr. Lipman, it's actually quite appropriate that uh, this event could be housed in the, um, the Rosenfield Building, the home of the Mailman School, because public health is inherently an interdisciplinary field and in many ways embodies all, of, all four schools here up at the Medical Center um, in a rather rich and robust manner. And um, we, like the other uh, schools here, have benefited immensely um, from PubMed and all the work that Dr. Lippmann's uh, group has done here. I know Dr. Lippmann is in many ways a celebrity of sorts. He may not think of himself as such, but um, I think um, within this audience, you are most definitely a celebrity. Um, and, um, but it does bear um, introducing him appropriately. Dr. Lippmann is the director of the National Center for Biotechnology Information, known as NCBI, as you know. And it's a major research and development division of the National Library of Medicine within the NIH. He was appointed as their first director in 1989, shortly after Congress created the center in 1988. He has overseen its growth, which has been a phenomenal growth, if I may add, into one of the most heavily used resources in the world for the search and retrieval of biomedical information with about, it's a staggering number, two million users each day. NCBI has a leadership role in conducting basic research in computational molecular biology and in storing, annotating, and making accessible biomedical information and genetic data emanating for research conduct at NIH and laboratories around the world. Dr. Lippman is uh, a native New Yorker, actually from Rochester. Um, he received his BA in biology from Brown University and his MD degree uh, right here in New York State from State University of New York at Buffalo. After his medical training, Dr. Lippman joined the mathematical research branch of the National Institute of Diabetes, Di Digestive and Kidney Disease as an NIH research fellow. He studied molecular evolution and developing computational tools for sequence and comparison. Dr. Lippmann is one of the developers of the original uh, BLAST, which is the basic local alignment search tool um, algorithm for rapidly identifying biological sequences that are similar to a queried sequence. Dr. Lippmann, as you all know, is a recipient of numerous awards as an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American College of Medical Informatics. Without further ado, I welcome Dr. Lippmann to the stage. I apologize ahead of time, I cannot stay for the talk, but um, it does allow me to remind you that this is being videotaped. So um, when you um, do ask questions a little later, if you'll come up to the mic, that'll be wonderful. And I look forward to watching uh, the videotape of this. So Dr. Lippmann, take it away. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, um, and uh, uh, it really is a, a pleasure to be able to uh, come. I uh, especially a pleasure to come when I'm, I, I don't have to deal with all the snow that uh, caused a cancellation of the previous uh, attempt at this. Um, it might be useful. It's not a big group to get a sense of what the backgrounds of some of y'all are, so that I can uh, I can ha show the same slides, but but sort of uh, cover different areas. So how many folks are more from the information science library, uh, library area here? OK. And how many are sort of researchers, uh, experimentalists? OK. And some are publishers. Yeah, you can go now. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> oh, you're OK. You're OK. Say hello to Mike for me. <laughs> OK. Uh, all right, so this uh, is taken from uh, Harold Varmus' book, um, The Art and Politics of Science, and, and really uh, shows that the notion that uh, 
uh, communicating and sharing knowledge has really been uh, uh, a really an important part of um, of of academics and, and and research for for many many years. And if we're look sort of at a more the modern period, the evolution towards towards uh, uh, resources like PubMed Central, see that in the uh, early 80s there was a huge investment in IT around the country um, that uh, made it possible for many people to have access to computers on their desktop, access to internet and so forth. We've actually spent um, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars to, to have a kind of infrastructure that allows for uh, rapid publication, rapid access to information. In fact, you know, people really forget that you know, if there was some decrease in cost of publishing and better access to information and so forth, it doesn't happen magically. It's actually a fairly small return on a massive investment that we've already been making. Um, uh, in the uh, early 80s also we saw the beginnings of, uh, of uh, sequence databases and, and certain principles of open access and international data sharing uh, also started then. So the sequence databases, you can imagine, are sort of all open access. People can take all the data, they can, they can sell it in different ways, they can do all kinds of things with it. You can get GenBank data from NCBI for free, but you can get that same data from companies, from other academic groups, and so forth. So there's a lot of diversity there. Uh, in 1988, uh, Congress established uh, NCBI, and uh, that was really at the beginning periods of the Human Genome Project. Uh, and uh, and and we've so we've been involved kind of at the interface of of the uh, molecular data and uh, and the online literature for right from the beginning. In '97, uh, PubMed was launched by uh, Vice President Gore uh, as a free uh, free access web-based bibliographic database. It really grew out of our, our understanding that if we were going to make the sequence data available, it was useful to have the associated abstracts from the papers also available and then we realized it was useful to have papers that were similar on the similar subject available and then after that we thought we might as well make it all freely available. As you probably know, Medline was available before that but it wasn't free. Okay, so the road to PubMed Central has always been a bit rocky but it started off in a very interesting way. Uh, uh, Harold Varmus and Pat Brown uh, were uh, eating at the uh, Tassahara Bakery Cafe and discussing new ways of getting information out and, and some of the potentials that uh, high throughput biology and genomics had and how it could be sort of held back because the literature itself was balkanized and wasn't freely available in the same way as the sequence data. At about the same time there was a meeting at the Banbury Center. Um, uh, it was a, a, a genome project workshop and there was a separate period set aside to discuss open access publishing. Paul Ginsberg, who is in charge of the uh, physics archive, was there. And it was a very spirited discussion um, that I had the privilege of being part of, which and included uh, uh, senior scientists, uh, graduate students, uh, some computer type folks, experimentalists, and, um, and actually uh, also the, uh, the publisher of the Cold Spring Harbor Press, who was actually uh, kind of blown away by the level of discontent with the current uh, status quo in publishing. I can remember the look on his face as the discussion kind of um, heated up even more and I, I, I don't think he enjoyed it. Um, in, uh, in May of 99, uh, Dr. Varmus proposed the eBiomed project. He sent a, a letter fairly widely which described a bunch of ideas which were just sort of churning around then. They really weren't um, there wasn't a sort of a fixed plan at the time, but it, uh, it was done in a way that got tremendous reaction from the publishers. And um, I, I think it was unfortunate that it, it kind of went out that way, but he thought uh, that, that it was going to be good to stir things up, and he did. Um, there were some ideas that were very ambitious and very different, uh, including an idea that uh, NIH grantees would be able to rapidly publish papers as long as they were communicated by two other grantees. Uh, it, it, this, this made a lot of press, but nothing happened for a little while because of all the excitement. 
And then in February 2000, uh, PubMed Central was launched. The earliest journals in there were the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Molecular Biology of the Cell. Um, and the idea behind this uh, archive was that if a publisher wanted to have their content archived, we would do it for free, we would keep it available. In general, they would give us content that was at least a few months or a year old, um, so it wouldn't impact on subscriptions. And um, uh, frankly, the people involved thought it was a good thing and that the publishers, especially the society publishers, would buy into it, um, although um, we were wrong. Um, most of them really were very nervous about it. A little bit after that, uh, uh, Biomed Central was started. It was a commercial for-profit company started by Vitek Troch. He created it to create open access journals. And fairly recently, that was sold to Springer, and, and, and Vitek made a fair amount of money out of that. And I think that that's a vindication of his notion that, in fact, open ac access publishing could be done in a profitable way. Now we see that PLOS One and some of the other PLOS journals are also highly profitable and again shows that this can be a sustaining way of, of publishing uh, science. In 2002, uh, Harold Varmus, uh, Pat Brown, and Mike Eisen uh, from Berkeley established the Public Library of Science as an online publisher. So the philosophy behind PubMed Central um, was, that, number one, it was quite consistent with the National Library of Medicine's general mandate uh, as a national library to acquire, organize, preserve, and disseminate the results of biomedical research, um, but to extend that to the electronic literature, which, as you know, it's a real challenge for libraries now that uh, in the past, when you had print, you could archive it in your library. Now, much of the content is available electronically, and you're only getting a subscription, and the libraries can't actively play a role in archiving. Um, the idea would be in PubMed Central that you would have free and unrestricted access to the material, and it would be uh, 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 integrated with all the other online information. Uh, and because the way we use the information would change over time, that it was very important to have it as an open archive so that you could keep curating and finding issues with how you've mapped the information into the digital format. And the library had found, actually, from uh, Medline for many years, that the best way to ensure that the electronic content was in a usable form was to actually keep using it in a lot of different ways. So that was an important aspect to it. So back in the beginning, the only way content would get into PubMed Central was that uh, a publisher would voluntarily offer to, to, to participate. They would sign an agreement. The copyright would be retained by the publisher or the author, depending on how that content came in the beginning. NLM would have a non-exclusive perpetual use license for the content. Generally, there would be free access within 12 months of publication, although some of the journals actually had it available immediately. The journal could stop depositing, could get out of the agreement at any time, but the content that was already in would stay available. Now, while PubMed Central has been associated with open access movement, in fact, the true open access articles are only a fraction of the content in PubMed Central. Most of the content does have restrictions that are imposed by either the publisher or, or the other copyright holder. Currently, um, PubMed Central also is a repository for author manuscripts. That's the form of the paper which has gone through all peer review and had all the revisions due to peer review. Um, uh, and, and that is often what is, the, what is supposed to be deposited under various funding agency mandatory deposition uh, uh, policies. So NIH has one of these policies after a year. Wellcome Trust and other UK funders have it after six months. Howard Hughes, uh, six months. The Canadian Institutes of Health Research also have these policies, and now a growing number of private foundations have mandatory deposition rules, which is if you get money from us, then after some period of time, the content has to be freely available in PubMed Central. We use the same digital infrastructure for the archiving of books and other documents, such as uh, practice guidelines. So one of the ideas from the beginning was to uh, uh, cross-link the literature with the underlying molecular databases and other databases. So the figure in this paper is just a picture of small molecules, but because we can mine out information about this and map it to the small molecule database, we can actually map this paper and the compounds in this to our compound database. And in this case, this isn't just a 
picture, we actually have the secondary structure of the molecule and can compute similar chemicals and do a variety of other computations on it. And we can connect it also to the protein structure database because the protein structures, when they come in, we can mine out the chemical ligands that are often co-crystallized with them and, and that way connect uh, as well. So these sorts of connections can be useful and I'll talk a little bit about how we currently use that and how, how we hope to in the future. PubMed Central has also become international. Actually, we always thought it would have to be international. That's our experience with all the other molecular databases we work on right now. There's a center in Canada and in the UK. Um, and the idea uh, would be that uh, the legal agreements would be between the publishers and NLM. And NLM would have agreements with other archives. And uh, all of this has to be consistent. It can be a little bit of a bother at times, but most of that is flowing along fairly smoothly. The idea is to protect the copyright and the integrity of the content uh, and also satisfy the publisher standards for the way the articles are presented um, and to provide consistent reporting of usage data. So all of the usage data can be aggregated for the publishers who are participating. I'm going to skip the multiple archiving centers. It's pretty obvious that the content is safer if it's available in more different places. But, uh, but there's also other reasons to have multiple archives, especially with the biomedical literature, because the use of that interfaces with the educational system of different countries and with the healthcare system of different countries, which differ more than, for example, the way people use DNA sequences in America and DNA sequences in Europe. I mean, they, we use them pretty similarly, but, but, but the actual uh, natural language content we, we do use differently. One aspect of PubMed Central, which was pushed very strong by the first group of advisors that we had, the, we have a formal advisory group, was to go back and for the journals that are participating, um, uh, digitize as much of the content as we could. And we've done that as a collaboration with the Wellcome Trust and the UK Joint Information Systems Committee. And, uh, and for as many of the journals that are participating that we can, we've gone back and, and, and digitized the content. And we think that's been a very successful project. We can see that that content is used quite a bit. And it goes back really quite far. And one of the things I've experienced in my own research is that I'm ending up using research that goes back to the 60s and 70s and say bacteriology that I never would have found otherwise. And, and, and I think it's unfortunate when you look, you can see that people have rediscovered things multiple times because they didn't have easy access to the older literature. As a side point, uh, we always felt that it would be most useful if we mapped all of these different journals, uh, their content, which would be in different formats into a single common archival format. Uh, after uh, an initial experience trying to do this, we developed uh, an XML DTD for journals. We did that, uh, a second phase of that, um, in cooperation with the Mellon Foundation uh, eJournal Archiving Program and made this public in 2003. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a flexible uh, uh, format. It, it, the, the content is supplied in a variety of source DTDs, and then we can map it into the archiving DTD. We also came up with a publishing DTD, a, 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 a digital specification for the format, which is more restrictive, and that's for groups that want to start authoring the content in an XML DTD. Now, approximately 70% of the articles coming to PubMed Central now are, are from sources that are already using this DTD. So it's really become somewhat of a standard. It was uh, agreed by the Library of Congress, the British Library, to make it a, a, a common standard for journal articles. Uh, and other countries are taking it on, and, and a number of the uh, commercial vendors are also um, using the, uh, the NLM DTD. Well, this is something that we found true for PubMed Central and actually true for most of our databases, which is that as the content as the, the database gets more comprehensive, the usage goes up approximately proportionally. And this is true for molecular databases, and it's also turning out to be true for PubMed Central, that the archive is more useful and therefore used more as it gets more comprehensive. And that, I think, was one of the motivations uh, for Dr. Zahuni and for Congress to get involved in making um, some aspects of the program no longer voluntary but uh, mandatory. So before public access, you could do a search of Google and, for example, find a, a paper on tumor biomarkers and then go to PubMed and, and see that this is work that's funded by NIH. And then you try to get it and you find out that you have to pay money for it. 
And I, you know, this sounds like a little story, but when when PubMed Central first started, I can remember getting a phone call from my dad one evening, and he was at a friend's house and had about five or six of his buddies, all of whom were fairly old at the time, and they were looking up something about prostate cancer. And they were using PubMed, one of them was clever enough, and they, they were using the system, and they found a paper and they wanted to get more information. This is a true story. I can remember telling this to some publishers, and they didn't like it, but my dad said, it says that it's funded by NIH. But when I try to get the paper, I can't get the paper. They tell me I have to spend 30 or 40 bucks. I can't remember what it was. And you know, we just want to use the paper. What's wrong? And uh, I had to explain to him that just because NIH funded the work and just because we can get you to the paper, the way it works is the publisher owns that paper. In fact, you could do a query in PubMed and get a whole bunch of papers that are funded by NIH, and only one of them might be available for free in PubMed Central. And so in December 26 of 2007, uh, Congress uh, made the uh, public access mandatory. Uh, essentially, if you got NIH funding, you had to make sure your paper was available in PubMed Central within a year of publication, or it was freely available within a year. It would be put in, submitted at the time of, uh, of acceptance. And in uh, 2009, this was uh, made a uh, uh, permanent policy. Uh, I would like to say that 100% of the papers are going in now. Uh, right now, we're at probably around 65% compliance rate. A number of steps are going to be taken over the next year that I think will move us up to closer to 100%. Uh, I think NIH has really tried to kind of take a light hand with this, but, um, but at times it becomes apparent that they have to step that up. Okay. So this will only apply to papers going forward. Publishers who've already, already uh, given access, the are not going to let their entire legacy of published papers be immediately available if they're older than here. It's only to do what's to get deposited. So, so the policy applies to all papers that were uh, coming out of research that was funded back back here. Okay, and so research that was funded before this uh, does not it does not apply. All right. Um, so yeah, I, I think even if we, even if we can make the future look better with that being in there, there's still going to be a lot of old content that uh, that won't be freely available. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk briefly um, about what we call our discovery initiative, uh, because it was also one of the motivations really for pushing more with um, uh, public access. So. This was motivated because we, we found that, that there were a million ways to improve pages in our website. Nothing was right, really, in my opinion. Everything could be improved. And we would sometimes put a lot of work into improving something, and then I would look at what they did, and I thought, why did we prioritize that? Why did we do that? What was the goal of that? It would be much easier if we had something like Amazon or we were like Google where all we're talking about is a simple objective function, clicking on an ad or buying something. Here, you know, what, what could we do? And, and what, what became apparent was that we could take advantage of a paradox that most users are not curious. Most users do not pick up rocks and see what's underneath them. If they don't see something interesting to them on a page, they don't click on anything. That's a, that's, that's a challenge. The good side of that is that if you do find them clicking on things, generally speaking, it's because they found it interesting or useful. Now, you can follow that up with interviews and do other kinds of studies, but we found that to be absolutely, as I say, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it makes it harder to get people to good information. On the other hand, it allows you to see when you're, when you're improving, because people won't do three clicks to get someplace. If you don't make it very easy for them, they won't go at all. And so. Our bottom line has to be something simple, and I call it discoveries. It's basically we need to improve the quantity and quality and the relevance of the information obtained and viewed by our users. And we need to be able, wherever possible, see that by studying our web logs. So we can design sites in the beginning with interviews. We can go back and ask users questions. But in the end, we have to really make sure that we deliver it and we see a change, a quantitative change, in how people are using our system. So we do want to interview users, but we focus also on iterating, uh, constantly developing a, a, a quantitative picture of how people are using our site, and then modify what we're doing, 
and then seeing if, if that's working better. All right. Now, it turns out that it is not easy to do this. It's not intuitive. And we're still struggling with it. But we can make, we, we've made quantitative, easy to prove examples of this. And sometimes our users are not even aware when we've made a change in the system. And we can see that, that a certain fraction of the users are doing better with it. So one thing you can see. And this is true for many sites. This data is no longer correct for our site, but it, it doesn't really matter. You can treat this as an abstract if you wish. That, that typically with any kind of search system, people will do a search. And sometimes they'll click right away, but sometimes they modify the search as soon as they see the results. And then they'll finally click something. Or sometimes they'll go back and do three different searches, and they'll click. And you see a distribution that looks like this. And different search systems, depending on how well they work, will have different uh, decay curves like that. But that also tells you that your query logs have a lot of useful information in them because people are typing in queries and then you can see do they click or not, what's happening, what did they actually type, what's the similarity of the queries to each other. And so you can mine the query logs in useful ways and, um, and one way to do that is through determining related queries. Basically uh, over here we have also try. All right, now we have a drop down that actually sort of steals the, the fraction of users that use this. But this is based on, on looking at queries that are more specific than the user's query uh, and, and that match it well. And, and, and these become suggested queries that, that might be better for the user than this. And what we find is that that related queries ad has worked very well. We get a, a click through rate of over 6% with that. Now, as I say, we, the drop-down, more of our users are using that, and so the number of people who end up having to use the, the related queries ad is less, but the, it, it's using the same kind of information. So this is the kind of thing that we do with everything now on our site. Uh, it takes a while to work through all the pages and to keep revisiting things. Another example is for the nucleotide database. If you look at the query logs, you see that a lot of the queries that users are making really would be better if they were queries in the genes database. That information is more curated and it's more organized. And if you're using a gene name as a query, it's probably a better place to go. And so we put this little ad at the top uh, here that uh, if you're looking for gene information, you might want to click there. And, um, and what we find, uh, I've switched already, but what we find is a very high fraction. It started off at about 14%. Now I think it's almost 25% of our users of this database click through to the gene ad, all right? uh, because it's been a better place for them to go. And what was interesting is in the beginning, it was about 15%. And then over time, that rate went up. Uh, this is the citation matcher. Uh, the, this uh, has a very high cl uh, click-through rate. Um, let's see. Uh, I didn't put that down. I think it's uh, something like 28 or 29%. And it's just a matter of us improving the citation matcher, and we will be improving it over the next couple months because we see how often it's used. We want to get as many queries where if they look like they were trying to do citation matching, get that to trigger. So now, right now in our system, we're trying to develop sensors and refine the sensors for disease names, for gene names, for drug names, uh, for citations, for a variety of other things. And then even though the basic query uh, handling of the query may work one way, we're automatically firing off many other types of queries and seeing, can we do a better match? That's basically the way Google does their system. Uh, there's a pretty good article recently in uh, Wired Magazine about how uh, uh, Google's search system works. Obviously, they do it in a more sophisticated manner than us. They have a lot more <laughs> infrastructure and so forth. But that basic approach is really what you have to do. You have to try lots of guesses at once, see what the results are, and then decide how to present uh, all of these different ways of viewing a query and present it back to the user. There's no magic algorithm. In fact, Google, a lot of people think, well, it's PageRank that Google uses. Actually, Google doesn't even use PageRank at all anymore, or barely at all. So we, we have a, a, a dashboard that we keep adding different kinds of tracking tools to various things that we're doing and seeing how they're working. Sometimes you fix one thing and it works better, but it makes something else not work as well. People don't use it as much or there's something degraded there. And so we have to keep track of it all. Every week or two, we have a meeting of all the senior people in the group with the people in charge of the weblog analysis uh, uh, project. And we go over various reports and 
discuss new things to analyze and so forth. So it's a lot of fun. It's very challenging. It turns out most people, even if they're smart folks and good in other areas, turn out not to be so good at analyzing web logs. It's, it, 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 you have to sort of be like Sherlock Holmes because you'll see something, you'll try to figure out what does it mean, then you have to sort of test if that were true, then we should see something else happen, and it gets very complex very quickly. But then when you get something right, it's amazingly, it's really a lot of fun because all of a sudden you see, wow, we got that one right. You, you, your numbers really pick up because if you have a couple million users, you really can get good statistics. We've changed the look of PubMed Central. We've gotten some good feedback on it. We also some show links down below. But one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, how should this look best on an iPhone? Because we definitely have requests for that. And so we're looking at how can we make a, a reasonable view of full text in an iPhone. What about for those people that have very widescreen monitors on their desk? Is there a better view? Is there a better presentation of the content that way? Perhaps, for example, all the figures in one scrollable window in, uh, and the, the text in the other. That way you can be keeping your, the figure that you're interested in on, on the screen at all times and look at other stuff. And so how we do this is we talk to various users, we get their ideas, we mock up certain things, we get back, get their feedback again, then we start to do testing and piloting. It's a lot of fun. It never goes as fast as you'd like, but, but I think you can make progress that way. All right, so last bit on this. So right now, we have almost two million articles in PubMed Central. Uh, the journal counts, uh, oh, actually there's 1.9 plus million uh, articles and the total items including issue covers, table of contents and so forth is over 2 million. We have 585 active titles that are in full participation, in other words all the articles go into PubMed Central and the NIH portfolio, those are journal publishers that only give us the content if it was authored as part of the NIH public access policy. Uh, we have 200 plus uh, titles there and selective deposit are from the primarily commercial publishers where uh, like Springer for example has a, a policy uh, author open choice or whatever so if the author pays then that content is automatically deposited. Quick change here and then I'll take questions. In many ways the although open access is a positive and so forth I think the returns on, on the investment with all the IT and so forth have not been as dramatic as we'd like for academic communication, for communicating scientific knowledge. Certainly in terms of the cost, journals are more and more expensive, textbooks are more and more expensive. Still much of the content is not as broadly available as you'd like. Just think of the small biotech companies around this country. They can't get at almost any of the content. It's way too expensive for them uh, to, uh, uh, to get subscriptions to everything. Um, the other problem that I think is even more important is that it takes so long to publish a paper, even in an open access journal, even in PLOS One, and it's such a bother, you know, you, you, so many of us experience something, you send a paper off, two of the referees like it, one says they want this, they want that, you go back and you forth, eventually maybe you end up having to go to another journal. It can take nine months to publish a paper that it only took you maybe a month or so to actually do the underlying work. Even worse than that is that because it's so much work to get a paper out the door and communicated, a lot of people are simply not publishing work, little discoveries which they don't see as important enough to put that much time into. And so a lot of discoveries just never get published and then they're rediscovered as needed. Uh, often these are the things that are the most sort of hard, very, very uh, uh, straightforward, very objective data but because they're not really part of the main research area of the, of the scientist, they just don't bother with it. So this, is, this has been very costly. It would be great to be able to, to publish just as easy uh, in science, or almost as easy, because we do want peer review, uh, as it is to do a blog or to be on some group site or whatever. And I think scientists have a kind of a split mentality now. You know, they, somebody can go on Wikipedia and see something they think is wrong and make a change, or they can have a blog or whatever, and have some idea and get it out the door. But with their own research, it's very, very slow. So it would be great if we had an approach that we could have almost something like a blog. Anybody can be an author. We can get feedback from readers and reviewers, but we had peer review as well. So actually, there is an option for that right now that we've been playing around with. We've been using the Google uh, Now authoring system. Uh, because of the pandemic uh, in spring, 
Uh, I contacted the folks at PLOS and at Google and suggested that we try to do a new kind of journal that would be very rapid turnaround, that would do screening to make sure by experts in the field that the content was fine, that the experimental met methods were solid and so forth, but would be fast. And essentially what, what we do is we use something, uh, the null system, where you author on the server, you actually compose the paper on the server, your profile, your Google profile contains all of your affiliation and other metadata, you invite your co-authors, their metadata and so forth is connected to the paper, and you just press a button to submit it, everything is there, all the figures, and if it's accepted, uh, it gets, gets peer reviewed, if it's accepted, you press a button, it's immediately available, and the next day, uh, PubMed Central gets the XML content because Google has worked uh, with us to have uh, uh, an output of the system that's already structured. So the system has fairly simple tools for online editing. It'd be nice if they were a bit richer. They may be increasing some of the richness of them, but it's enough to do papers that look okay. There's a sort of a simple citation reference manager uh, in it where you can put in PubMed IDs and it'll generate your, your references, or you can cut and paste them in from some other source. You uh, upload your figures in a variety of image formats, and you can control the placement and the size and the way it appears to users. But from the point of view of archiving, when we get it, we actually get the full uh, uh, resolution uh, figure and the uh, uh, legend and so forth attached to it, and that all is tagged appropriately. And then you just press a button when it's ready to submit, and off it goes. Here's an example of a paper uh, on the Google site. There's some aspects that look like a standard paper. If we were to scroll down, you could see that. And there's some aspects that are a little bit different. You know, you have the pictures of people. I found it really interesting in the beginning when we started this. We now have about 60 articles or so in there. Uh, people wouldn't have a picture at all of themselves. You'd just see a, sort of a cartoon empty box. Uh, and then you started to see some very stiff pictures. And then you saw some other pictures. Uh, there was one graduate student who, who was kind of funny to watch the, the evolution of the pictures until there was a kind of a very dramatic uh, 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 almost fashion model picture. Uh, there's another person who keeps changing their picture because this is just linked to their Google profile and, and so we sort of get a sense of, of what they're doing with their life as they go. But anyway, uh, the, the watching the sociological aspects of this is interesting. So how can you start a new journal with a system? Essentially you define a scope and the approach you want to do for peer review. You recruit other chief editors and a core sort of a standing group of, of relevant peer reviewers. And then you can set the journal up on, for example, this Google Null site. Um, and if you provide a description uh, of the journal and the goals and, the, and all of that um, uh, and who's on the masthead and so forth to the NLM Collections Committee, it's possible that that would be considered for inclusion in the NLM Collection and therefore would be available in PubMed Central and in PubMed, and so then you can have archiving and everything else. So that's what's happened with PLOS Currents Influenza. There's another journal ready to start uh, from a group of French researchers. The CDC is going to be announcing a systematic reviews journal using this, and PLOS is now talking about expanding PLOS Currents Influenza into a number of other areas. There's also a very large uh, funding agency in another country that's looking at starting a couple journals um, using this null system, and again, focusing on uh, aspects like rapid peer review, post-publication peer review as well, um, and, and um, I think uh, hopefully we'll start to see this really take off. These are the folks that work on our digital publishing efforts, including PubMed Central. There's Sergey Krasnov, who's he's, uh, done a great job running it, and let's see, uh, Jeff Beck over here, who... Uh, there he is. He's a beekeeper and... Uh, the master of XML, and uh, it's just a great crew to work with. Uh, we've been really lucky to have a, a stable group working on the project. So I'm ready. Thank you very much. Any questions? I was just wondering if you could talk about the process by which a null journal is considered for inclusion in NLM. So the, the NLM has a mandate to collect and archive the literature. And so what, what they want to be able to do with a new journal is decide, is it in scope? Um, is it 
you know, what is the, is there an explicit policy in terms of how the peer review is being done, who are the people involved with it, and so forth. Um, and then they also actually want to see on the order of uh, a dozen articles. Um, in some cases, for example, if it's a publisher like PLOS, which already has a track record, maybe only a half dozen articles or whatever might be necessary. Uh, if it's just a group of academics uh, not associated with a publisher, they want to see more articles. And then they look at it and they also do ask for input from other folks to see whether it looks like these, you know, this is uh, reasonable and then, and then that's that. So largely it's fairly inclusive. This is not the same as being, you know, chosen for indexing, uh, for mesh indexing in PubMed. That could happen downstream, which requires more articles and uh, an outside review. Uh, but uh, so this is fairly lightweight. As the content in PubMed Central increases, are there any plans to index that full text so that's searchable, sort of the way Google Scholar allows you to search across the text rather than just the abstract and the mesh associated XML? That's a good question. So it actually, the full text is searchable now, um, but I would not say that we're that happy with our approach to full text retrieval. Um, there's been a lot of studies done comparing retrieval of just the abstracts and mesh terms and so forth versus the full text. What you can show is if you're using a really good approach, searching the full text is a little bit better, but surprisingly not that much better. And, um, and so we're, we are working on that. I mean, you already can do it if you search directly in PubMed Central you, in, as opposed to PubMed. What we're working on is actually incorporating more of the information from PubMed Central into the PubMed search so that at least for the articles that we have the full text, there's other things we can get. And it's not just in terms of retrieval, it's also in terms of what you show the user. So when you, if, so we're moving to create a, an image database with all of the figures that are in our books and in PubMed Central and separately searching that as well as these other things because maybe in fact what's really most useful to you is seeing a particular figure and that's the one, oh, now I know that is what I want, that's got what I want. And so if you really look at Bing and Google, whatever, you, you learn a lot about why they're doing certain things. You want to have a separate image database, and you want to be searching that all the time and have certain tricks work there, certain statistical text retrieval for that. Show people some of that. Maybe you're lucky that you actually showed them directly what they wanted, but maybe what you've done is trigger their mind to think, actually, I'll, I'll switch and just press the button to see just the image search. And so we're moving in that direction, incorporating uh, image searching and full text searching and our book searching, a, a subset of the books will be getting PubMed abstracts and will be in PubMed now. Certainly things like the uh, practice guidelines, books that uh, where they really designed them from the beginning was sort of like a little abstract and so forth per chapter, that's going to be in, in the PubMed search. You'll be able to turn that off and you'll be able to distinguish when you're doing the search, but that's going to be fairly soon. That's actually going to be within a matter of weeks. That, that that'll be in the search as well. Any other questions? Um, we're anxious at our institution to find out if we can, through PubMed Central, track our institution's uh, open access articles, uh, search it periodically every month or every however often, and um, get a list of a full list of uh, our open access articles. We try to do something through PubMed with um, a strategy that we were given by the NLM help desk, the PubMed help desk, but it's not picking up everything. Right. That's the question. So. We've done a little experiment with the folks at Harvard Medical School to provide something for them and see how that works. Um, and um, most likely, when we're confident and they're confident that seems to be working, we'll, we'll try to extend that. I do think it's likely that NIH will be contacting the offices of sponsored research to let them know what articles are out of compliance and get their assistance in, in making sure that, that, that those get in. Um, and there's other things that we're working on, um, two projects that overlap, one's called My Bibliography, which already exists but is being generalized so that um, authors can easily update, kind of keep electronic uh, bibliography on our system for the PubMed records, but also for book chapters or patents or whatever else. And um, 
and our author ID project, which will involve computational disambiguation. Once you have one of these my bibliographies, if you did a paper and you didn't enter it into your bibliography, you'll get, oh, is this your paper? Do you want to include that? And then you can get that printed out in various ways, but you can also have that uh, if your institution is interested, have automatic reporting where the author says, okay, I want that stuff to go to the institution and that, that, can, that can provide structured reports for you. So there'll be a number of ways for institutions to use the information. Uh, but I mean, I think in the end, uh, you know, there's sort of different populations of of researchers who are funded and some of them are more resistant than others but I think that they'll move along you know when if their office of sponsored research contacts them I think they'll be more responsive uh, chances are at some point NIH may end up having to say to somebody gee I, we, you know you're funded you're great but you're not going to get your funds until your articles are in and I think just a few examples of that and, and people will be more responsive I was wondering what you could tell us about what it took politically to get the appropriation bill passed. So I'm not a politician. Um, what I would say is that uh, it has always been the case that actually Congress was ahead of NIH in terms of wanting this policy. So starting way back there have been efforts in Congress to push to have uh, more access or open access actually even at times uh, of NIH funded content and so um, while there has been a lot of back and forth when publishers were upset about it and they would tell the staffers things we'd have to go to them and explain no this is this is actually how we see it or these are the facts as we know them and so forth so there has been back and forth that way but most of the most of the initiative really for the policy at all stages has come from Congress. And it's not too surprising. It's kind of a no-brainer unless you're in a district where a publisher is very active. Um, the fact is that uh, Congress is already spending the money on the research. It's kind of an easy gift to your state to make sure that the content's freely available. And they are actually hearing from their librarians, the state universities and so forth, that increasingly the leading universities and certainly the smaller universities and colleges are not having access to um, federally funded research. Um, so it, it, it's really not been NIH that's led the, you know, that kind of led this. Uh, as much as I would have liked to see all the papers freely available and whatever else, um, that's not really been, it's not really been the NIH position. It's really more come from both librarians, some of the politicians who have been in contact by their librarians and, uh, or other advocacy groups, and, uh, and just a number of the staffers who kind of understood how this was going and really wanted to push it through. Hi. Uh, would you happen to have some schematic that shows uh, how you can limit a search? Do you have an uh, advanced search? that one can go into so you can narrow it down to NIH articles, uh, full text, uh, time frames? Um, I'm not the best at demoing the system because I have fairly idiosyncratic way of using it, but there is a filter uh, right on the PubMed search page to just get free full text. Um, and that would include not just the free text articles in PubMed Central, but also the articles that are free available on the publisher site. So if, if one of the issues is that you want to just get the free articles, right on the front of the PubMed page when you do a search, there's a little thing on the right that allows you to just get the free articles. Can we be sure that all the articles deposited in the uh, PubMed Central are the final versions, or uh, there may be some discrepancy between the version in uh, PubMed Central and uh, commercially published article? Well, I, I think that the, the tack that was taken um, on the issue was that, uh, that um, the version of the article which the U.S. government felt was most obviously one that they could claim control over was the author's final manuscript, which is the one prior to copy editing. 
and that's the one that, uh, that they've pushed for. Um, if a publisher decides to participate in PubMed Central for those articles, then the final published article uh, is in PubMed Central. But otherwise, I think for a variety of reasons, and I don't know if they were primarily legal reasons or you know, sort of balancing off things with the publishers, they decided to just push for the author final manuscript. I have to say that while authors don't like the fact that they end up having to follow up in terms of checking their, their manuscript, which we tag, and so forth. Uh, in terms of the users, we haven't gotten a lot of complaints or problems. Every once in a while, there's been an article that an author feels there was substantial changes made in copy editing, and they'd like, you know, that, that, they, that there's some awkwardness. But um, that has not been, that's not been as much of an issue as some people felt it would be. Okay, well thank you very much.